Hey, look, uh, you know, I haven't drawn this on the board in a while. This used to be kind of like one of my little claims to fame. I remember when the Lord gave me a revelation and as I was writing it down, I'm not that really famous, I'm just, that was a joke. Uh, I used to write it down on the little paper at the clinic where I work. You know, it's a little, you ever been to the doctor's office and they pull the examination paper on top of the examination? If you don't know, I'm also a nurse practitioner. So anyway, I, when the Lord was revealing these truths to me, I was so excited about it that I would draw this out on the on the paper at work. And that's how I first started teaching this long before I was ever really a Bible teacher. And uh, so whenever I started the church, that's why I have a chalkboard because I like to write on the chalkboard. But, you know, there's always different ways and angles to look at this pictorial illustration that I'm about to give you. And that's the reason that I'm going to draw it on the board this morning because I have... A bigger, like not a bigger, but a deeper concept that I want to share with you that I think will go along with my message. But, you know, and those of you that have been here for a while, you're already familiar with this. But the way that I would always start this is that I would draw this guy right here. And, uh, you know, he, this guy right here is the old man. The Apostle Paul called him the old man. He's the man born of Adam. Right. His name is Adam. Because, see, in your first birth. You were born like your father Adam. You see, Adam, Adam was created without sin, but then when Adam sinned, all of his offspring, he's the fountainhead of humanity, all of his offspring received uh, a sinful nature. And, and then what happens is, is that this sinful nature compels us to go towards sin. We live in the midst of a modern church that doesn't want to hear about sin, but I'm here to tell you that that is my malady. That is your malady. That's a fancy word for sickness. That is our sickness. It's sin that is the problem. All right? And so this guy, Adam, right here, let me just say what I'm really trying to get to this morning. He's bound with all kinds of things, and I'm not going to start writing them out there. But let me just list a couple of them. Things like lust. Lust drives a person towards fornication, which means sex outside of marriage. I'm, if you came looking for a house that's not going to tell you the truth, I'm going to tell you the truth this morning. Amen. Amen. And one thing you need to know about this preacher is everything I'm going to list to you, I probably have dealt with in my own personal life. Right, right. Uh, at the same time, not just fornication, but adultery. Right. right? Not, not only that, but pornography. Yes. All right. Uh, and, and lust for other things. Lust for drugs. See, the word lust means a desire. Really, the word lust in the Greek is epithumia, and the word desire can actually, according to the context, be a, a good desire or a bad desire, depending on the context. But we're talking about sin right now, so it's bad. Lust for drugs, lust for alcohol that makes you... Look, you do what you want with alcohol. I'm just telling you, whenever I try it, I don't know, I've shared this story before. When I drank before I got, before I got saved, I acted like a fool. You hear me? Right, right. And drinking for me just led to something else. Right. Whenever I got saved, the Lord spoke to my heart. I heard it. Nobody else heard it in the room, but I heard it and said, you ain't supposed to be drinking. Yeah. But then I went and got me all this education. Now I'm sitting at the table with doctors. Everybody's sipping their red wine. I'm like, hmm, I have arrived. Come for me to have a glass of wine. Problem with Matt was is that it didn't stop in one glass. Oh, well, you're an alcoholic. You call it whatever you want. But whenever I got two or three glasses of wine in me, I started thinking different. Right, right. I started talking different. Yes, I started acting different. The Word of God says in Ephesians 5 and 18, Be not ye filled with wine, but be ye filled with the Holy Ghost. Yes. See, you allow enough wine to get up in your belly. It diffuses into your bloodstream. It begins to circulate throughout your body. And it begins to change the way your brain functions. Yes. You start looking at men or women in a way that you... People, women and men that you ain't supposed to be looking at in a way that you ain't supposed to be looking at them. You start talking to them in a way you ain't supposed to be talking to them and you start planning things that you ain't supposed to be planning. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you that that is not the will of God. See, that is contrary to the will of God. That is the world, not the church. That is the kingdom of darkness, not the kingdom of light. And if you are indeed a child of the light, then you're supposed to be separated out from the darkness by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Ain't no better way for me to describe it to you than that. So when Matt goes to drink and he don't act like a Christian, he acts like a fool. I don't know what you do when you drink. You do your own thing with that. But I can tell you one thing, if it also opens up to the door, the next thing you know, you're smoking weed. And the next thing you know, you're doing other stuff. Like, look, look, brother, come on, dude. Do I really have to break it down for you like that? Okay, anyway, that, that was a whole other story. Why didn't you get in that? I'm going to tell you one. Lust towards things 
That, and so, you know what? When the Lord begins to remove all of that, though, see, that's what that dead man, he's born with that. He's got a compulsion to go towards that. Right, right. When the Lord begins to remove all of that, now he can finally get to the things he really wants to get to. The personality issue. The selfish issue. The bad attitude issues. The I got to say the last word issue. I got to say the word that's going to press your button issue. I got to try to aggravate you issue. I got to always be right and you got to always be wrong issue. I got to always be elevated and you be below me issue. No, that's not the will of the Lord. That's not the heart of Jesus. That's not the way our master behaved himself. And so once the Lord gives you a revelation, because what this pictorial, this pictograph, if I could call it that is, it's an illustration of really the entirety of the gospel about how the old man was going to die in Christ. That that's the whole plan of the father, that he would send us Jesus and that he would give us new life in Christ. Amen. And so once that happens, I mean, let me go ahead and finish, finish the, the, the illustration that that what the gospel teaches us. Is that because we were born in sin, this is Jesus, this is Adam, the first man born of Adam. Because we were born in sin, so you can put faith right here. Faith in Jesus and what he did for us at the cross. The seed and the sacrifice, not just Jesus the teacher, not just Jesus the miracle worker. No, Jesus the bloody savior. Jesus, the bloody, naked Savior that hangs on a cross that is offensive to the modern church, that they don't want to talk about that because it makes them be reminded of sin. But brothers and sisters, we're all in the same boat. We all got the same problem. We all born in sin, and that's why we needed Jesus to set us free. Hallelujah. But, but sometimes we don't want to be told when we got sin in our life. Why? Because we love us. Right? In our flesh. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. We love it. We want to embrace it. We want to pet it. We want to hold on to it and cuddle it because we don't want to let it go because it's such a part of us. But the Lord, no more bondage, no more chains. The Lord wants to break us free from that. Hallelujah. So that we can begin to walk in freedom and liberty. And so that we can begin to reflect the love of Christ to a lost and a dying world. Amen. If we stay in bondage like the man of Gadarene, how in the world is anybody going to see Jesus? But no, whenever he breaks it free, whenever he gives us liberty and freedom and we begin to be able to love and we begin to be able to respond differently than the way the world would respond to certain situations. Oh, man, they know that there's something different about us. And let me tell you something. That's the Holy Spirit doing that. That's not you waking up one day and hunkering down and figuring it out. No, you're not going to be able to do it like that. You need the help of the Holy Spirit. And the reason that you have the help of the Holy Spirit is because I forgot to I forgot to draw this the right way. There's supposed to be a box right here, right? Because when you put faith in Christ, according to Romans chapter six, God, the Holy Spirit puts you in Him. That's right, Amen. You were, that's what it says in Romans six, chapter three through five, that you were baptized into Him. We're not talking about water baptism spiritually. When you got saved, you might not have known this, but the Holy Spirit put you. In Christ. That's yes. in 1 Corinthians yes. 12, 13. Yeah. By one spirit, you've been baptized into one body. Water baptism outwardly symbolizes what happens spiritually. In the mind of God, the old man that was born of Adam, if you're not born again this morning, right now, in your chair, yeah. you need to say, Jesus, please yeah. come into my heart. You can get saved right now while I'm talking to you and teaching. All you got to do is say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner, but I believe you're the answer for my sin. I want to invite you into my heart, and I want to die to my sin, and I want to be read, Lord, I believe you're the answer. So you don't even Lord. have to say all that. You say, Jesus, I need you. Yeah. Save me. Got a warrant. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes, Hallelujah. you got a warrant, though. <laughs> and, and, and you invite him in. Yes. Amen. You're like, oh, but he's going to take over. Trust me, brothers and sisters. You're going to be happy yes. when you relinquish right. control to yes. him. Yes. Yes. That's the problem we have. We're trying to hold on to the old self, and he's getting in the way. All right. But in the mind of God, this is what happened. When you receive him on that day, if you just did it, man, congratulations. <laughs> You got saved. The angels, you know what the word of God says? If you got saved, the angels are singing in yes. glory. Yes. Yes. Amen. I wish yes. I had time to preach on that this morning. <laughs> the word of God says that they literally, it's like they're standing <laughs> over heaven. <laughs> they're on the precipice of heaven and they're looking over. They're like, look, another one got saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We don't understand 
find is because our celestial angelic brethren went their own way and they were cast out of heaven and they can never come back. But look at this creation that never even saw the glory of God. And yet God would allow Jesus to descend past the angels to, so that he could come to redeem the seed of Abraham according to the book of Hebrews. And now the angels stand on the precipice of heaven and they're waiting for another soul to get saved. And when they do, they get glory in heaven. That's a beautiful word, children. Amen. Amen. So whenever in the mind of God, when you get saved, what happens is, is that your old man, it's like you die with Jesus. Amen. Is what it says, Romans chapter 6, you were baptized into his death. You were baptized into his burial. And even as he was raised to newness of life, so should you be. Because, see, it's a joint union. It's a spiritual connection. That's why we call it communion, common union. We're all common in our union with Christ. Why? Because we're all believers believing that he died for our sin. And when we partake of the elements together, we're remembering what brings us together. His death, burial, and resurrection has made us all one. Common union. Amen? Amen. Now, you're going to have a common union with the world. I've said this before many a time. You could be a marathon runner. How many times have I told y'all that? Y'all get tired of my story? I'm going to try to come up with some new ones. I went run a marathon one time, and they, they had about 10, 15 people of men dressed in tutus and leotards and all kind of crazy stuff because that was their little common union. And I'm not even saying that it's a problem if you got it if you're part of a marathon club. That's not what I'm saying. But that ain't going to get you to heaven. Hello. Common union of the body of Christ is that we all believe Jesus died on the cross to set us free from our sin. Yes. And that we need him. Yes. Amen? Yes. Alright. We died in him, we were buried with him, and even as he was raised from the dead, we too should walk in newness of life. Now we are in Christ, seated in heavenly places, according to Ephesians chapter 2. <coughs> this is your new position. So where you are, your little piece of earth that God has given you, that you travel each and every day, whether it be from your house to your work or to wherever, Walmart, wherever you go, you're just like an Old Testament tabernacle or tent carrying the presence of God along with you upon this world as you journey this life. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say to you? Yes. Amen. The presence of God lives in you. If you're saved this morning, hallelujah, the Holy Ghost lives in your heart. Amen. And everywhere you bring him, you bring him Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad he's merciful? Amen. Aren't you glad he's gracious? But listen, what I want you to know is, is this, is that we're all in the process of learning. Yeah. We're all in the process. And so what's supposed to be happening is, is that daily, see, this was the first time you got saved, right? When you right. first put faith, but you're supposed to be, we're supposed to be dying daily. Yeah. We're supposed to be reminded to see, this becomes the new object of your faith for your daily walk with God. Uh, listen, I'm getting deep right now. Some of you, you've already heard this so many times, it should just be really a review. But for a second, it might get a little bit deep. You know, faith requires an object. Faith is somewhat abstract. You know, you ever heard the difference between concrete and abstract artwork? Okay, you have Monet. You ever seen the Monet water lilies? You can barely tell it's a flower, but then when you start looking, man, that's beautiful. What is okay, faith is somewhat of an abstract concept because it just means to believe but what do I believe in if the preacher is not over here preaching and teaching on what to believe in then what does it really mean to have faith I'm talking about daily faith what is the object of your faith supposed to be is it supposed to be how much you read the Bible because if that be the case every last one of us are probably gonna just walk out of here with our head down because ain't none of us in this place probably read the Bible as much as we should have. And if we did, then we probably didn't pray as much as we should have. And if you did, then please forgive me. I'm not trying to step on your toes. Okay? Uh, you know? But, 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 but is, is our object of our faith how much we pray? Is it how much we read the Bible? Is it how much we come to church? Is it how many ministries that we're involved in? No. That's not what the gospel teaches. The gospel teaches that the object of our faith is the darling of heaven. Yeah. Jesus Christ and him crucified because see what i want you to understand is this is that it's our faith in him and what he did for us at calvary that brought us in he is the door to the sheep no man comes unto the father except by me when we keep faith in him what you need to understand is is that in this place you and i are now covered in righteousness 
We're covered in his righteousness. I mean, some of the kids, I don't even know if they would remember. They probably were half asleep when they asked me to come do that little devotion on the Saturday morning thing. But I walked up in here with a cape on, acting the fool. Because I was clothed originally with the sin of Adam, but then I changed my cape to a white one. It was black originally, and then I changed my cape to a white one because now I've been clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. I got to tell you that I'm teaching you something that's a very deep thought that has to trans that has to transfer into belief, right. into trust. It has to go from your head to your heart. Yeah. Revelation of the Holy Spirit has to reveal to you yes. that you are no longer guilty. Amen. That whatever that worst thing that you ever did was, it no longer held to you. Amen. I can tell you that all day long until the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. And that's what you and I need, brothers and sisters. That's what you call justification by faith that you've been declared righteous by the God of glory. Why? Not because you did it all right, but because the one that he sent in your place did it all right. And you put faith in that. And a transference took place where he took your guilt and he gave you his righteousness. And now if you will believe that, that's the object of your faith. He's the answer. Keep faith right here in this every day. And guess what starts to happen? Lust starts to fall off. Amen. Amen. I was in Venezuela one time on a, when I was in the oil field and I was trying to get in decent shape because I was overweight. And I started jogging. And one of the things I noticed is that these fruit trees were everywhere and there was just rotten fruit all over the ground. And later on, whenever... The Lord started to give me a revelation of this when I'm trying to talk to you. The Lord reminded me of that little jog down that road where there were rotten fruit all over the ground. Because things in my life that I had been trying to get free from started to fall off under the power of the <clears throat> The things that I was trying so hard to get free from, when I began to believe I can't do it, I need the Lord to do it. I'm going to trust in you, Lord. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit started doing this. Like a bunch of rotten fruit just falling off a tree. Or ripe fruit falling off a tree. And just dying on the wayside. Because, hallelujah, God was now doing the work instead of me trying to make it happen. Amen. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, And when your faith gets right, now all of a sudden, he starts making our life right. But it's a process, amen. amen. It's a daily process. So don't give up, Christian. Amen. Stay strong in the faith. Keep on walking, amen. Keep on marching, Christian soldier. That's what Paul called Timothy. Be a good soldier, amen. All right, here we go. So I want you to keep all this in mind as we go through this message. All right? My message title this morning is The Spirit of Servanthood. Now let's take a look at John chapter 13. And we're going to actually read verses 1 through 17. It says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God, and went to God. He rises from supper and he laid aside his garments and he took a towel and girded himself. After that, he pours water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. You ever thought about that before? I mean, just real quick, you ever thought about somebody else washing your feet? I mean, it's one thing, I, I'm going to be honest with you, and I ain't ashamed to tell you, I don't even go and got a pedicure. And listen, I don't, I, now I kind of go back frequently, to be honest with you. I mean, you think whatever you want about me, I don't even really care. And I, okay, but let me tell you something. It's one thing whenever I pay that lady to wash my feet. But you can imagine somebody, if you all of a sudden was like, hey, brother, I'm going to wash your feet, sir. Wade. <laughs> Look at Wade. Robert. Go ahead and pull your shoes off, sir. Pull your socks off. Go to the basin and I'm going to wash your feet. All right, yeah. Think about it. I'm doing that on purpose because I want you to think about that. How, ooh. I understand that it was part of their culture. Everybody's feet were nasty. It was actually a thing of honor, great honor for a house for a house owner to provide a servant to wash his guest's feet because their feet were nasty. I mean, they wore sandals. They walked on dirt roads. There was all kind of animals. Can you imagine the animals? Manure all over the place, right? So, I mean, your feet are pretty nasty. And so it was a great, it was a definitely a, a thing of their custom. 
But I'm just saying, dude, think about it right now. If I walked up to you and said, take your shoes off, I'm going to go ahead and wash your feet now. That's going to create a little bit of a funny feeling. Right? <laughs> All right. He says that he, uh, he, to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then comes he to Simon Peter, and Peter says unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do you know not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. You don't understand it right now, but you'll understand it. Peter says unto him, You shall never wash my feet. And he felt weird too. <laughs> Jesus answered him, if I wash you not, then you have no part with me. You're not connected to me, Peter. If you're not going to let me wash you, then you, you can say you're connected to me, but you're really not. Simon Peter says unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Because I really want to be connected to you, Jesus. Jesus says unto him, he that is washed needs not to not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. What he meant by that was this. You don't need to wash everything, Peter, if you've already been saved. Okay, you believe the word. You believe the word that the Father sent, which is me. You're, you're clean. But you, the only thing you need now washed is your feet. All right, you're all clean except not all of you. There's one that's not clean. Judas Iscariot is in the room right now. I want you to think about that too. I want you to think about the fact that Judas, the betrayer, is in the room. And Jesus knows that Judas is the betrayer in the room. All right. And he says, uh, he says, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, you are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, know ye what I have done to you? Do you understand what just happened? You call me master and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. I am indeed your master and Lord. If I did, your Lord and master have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So does he, you think that the Lord is trying to say that even in modern day church right now, we need to all take our shoes off and start washing each other's feet? Because I mean, a lot of times people have taken this. I've actually been part of a foot washing kind of like a little ceremony before. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's a very humbling thing. I'm not recommending that we have a foot washing ceremony, but I'm just telling you, that's why I would said all that because it is. It's like, if, at first it seems weird, but when you like just kind of surrender to it, it's actually a very humbling thing okay but i'm telling you right now that the lord wasn't trying to make this like communion in the church but some people have taken that almost like a communion thing and now they have these foot washing ceremonies okay but that's not what the lord's talking about <clears throat> the spirit of something that's behind it, yeah. right a spirit of it results in humility and that that's really what the lord's getting at is a servant a, a humility a humble spirit amen? amen he says for i have given you an example that you should do as i have done to you verily verily i say to you the servant is not greater than his lord neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him he's speaking to his disciples in the room right now but you are all disciples of the lord jesus christ amen. whether you realize that or not yes. because you are a you know the word disciple means it means to be a learner of christ if you are truly a born-again christian and you love god and you have a desire to learn more about jesus then you are a disciple amen. of the lord you might not be one of the original 12 but you are a disciple amen. and what the lord is telling you and i this morning is that the servant isn't greater than his Lord. Are you greater than your Lord? Of course not. I'm just trying to make a point. He's speaking that. You're not greater than me. He says, and neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. So here we have this scene. This is really close to the cross. I mean, this is right, right on the cusp of Passover or right at Passover. And Jesus was crucified on Passover. This is the last one for him. He's about to go to the cross in the next day or so. Okay. As a matter of fact, he was betrayed this night. All right. Now, I want you to see the behavior. We're about to get into it a little bit more here in a second. But I want to contrast his response to some things to his, some of his disciples. We talked about this recently on a Wednesday because I bring these poor guys up all the time. I pick on them. Um, but Lord knows that I've been similar. And we don't even have to turn there, really, because I'm just going to try to talk to you about it to make for sake of time. But in Mark 10, 32 through 45, Jesus, this is another gospel story that, that describes Jesus is now on his way to Jerusalem to go to the cross. So he's on his way and he's about to have this night that we just read about. And, and he's on his way to Jerusalem and he tells them on the way, he says, hey, listen, 
I'm going to be delivered over to the Gentiles. That means the Romans, basically, at that point in time. And he says, look, this is what they're going to do. They're going to mock me. They're going to scourge me. It means they're going to take a whip and they're going to beat me with it. And they're going to spit on me and they're going to kill me. But I'm going to, I'm going to raise again on the third day. And, uh, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, I, if you remember me, if you were here Wednesday night, you'll remember this, that I've said this. This is what they said. This is what he just said. He just said, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. They're going to spit on me. They're going to mock me. They're going to whip me. And this is what James and John, the sons of Zebedee, said. Hey, would you grant that we could sit on your right or your left hand when you come into glory? What? Doesn't that choke you up every time you hear that? I mean, think about that. Jesus is about to face the worst moment of his life, and the people that are closest to him want to know, hey, will you put me on the right and the left side? Mm. I want, you know, I, but, 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 okay, I get all that, Lord. You're about to die. I know they're going to spit on you. But, but what about me? Right. Well, what do I get? Because I want to serve you. I don't want to walk with you. But what am I going to get out the deal? Yeah. All right? Oh and he said, but this is what he says. He says, listen. The Gentiles are behaved the way you're behaving. Because, see, you're wanting a position of authority. All you can think about is you being a leader. All you can think about is you being elevated and puffed up. All you can think about is what you're going to get out the deal. That's the way the Gentiles think. But the children of God don't think that way. Because it's a whole different kingdom that you and I are supposed to be operating within. As a matter of fact, if you go back and you read, uh, we might read a little bit of it this morning, but out of Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, that was when he was on the, the mountain, you remember that? And he gave that sermon. He was actually, as a king in the chapter of, uh, in the book of Matthew, as a king speaking to the citizens of his kingdom. That was when he said, the meek shall inherit the earth. Right? Because God's kingdom is flipped upside down compared to the world. The world says you got to elevate yourself. The world says you got to throw people out of your way as you're climbing to the top. The world says you got to take what you got coming to you. The world says, you know, uh, fist for fist, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The world says you jack me, I jack you. The world says you do me dirty, I'm going to do you dirty. The world says you take from me, I'm going to take you to court. The world says all of these things, but God says something different. It's such a hard thing to imagine. Oh, what are you saying, preacher? Uh, you know, look, people are facing all kinds of different things. So if you think I'm picking on whatever, listen, I'm just trying to make a point. I'm trying, I'm trying to talk about things that are going on in society today. Right, things right. that people deal with yes. today. All right? Amen. So what are you saying, preacher? If, if she leaves me or if he leaves me and he's trying to take everything from me, I shouldn't go get an attorney? I, dude, I'm not trying to tell you to let somebody... Take every, everything from you? That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that if you go and you get counsel from an attorney, dude, I'm here to tell you right now that the counsel is not going to be the same thing you're going to find in the Word Amen. of God. Yeah, so you can go pay for your counsel from your attorney and you can make some certain decisions, but I hope you can hear the voice of God and all yeah, that. They're going to be telling you to, 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 take them, to take them to the cleaners. Is that the will of God? No. You can go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but I can tell you right now, that is not going to line up according to, and even if they quote some scripture to you, right. the overall wisdom that they try to impart to you is not going to be godly wisdom. It's not going to line up with the word of God. Right. Because much of worldly wisdom is actually going to try to promote and elevate itself. Whereas what the gospel teaches is this. This dude right here, he must die. Right. Amen. That doesn't mean that you need to die physically. That doesn't mean that God's never going to, because we're about to get into that. No, God wants to bring you to this place of humility so that he can build you back up again. So that he can go to battle for you. So that no matter what the attorney thinks they're going to get for you, God can make sure that you get what is right for you as long as he is in your battle. He is your counselor. He is your healer. He is the one that can make things right for you in the midst of your life. But will you trust him when you find yourself in the worst of circumstances? Or will you trust the counsel of your friends like Job? Or will you trust the counsel of some other professional that's giving you information that's contrary to the word of God? And those are our choices. 
So Jesus tells them, listen, that's what the Gentiles want to do. But listen, but whosoever will be great among you, this is in that cha Mark chapter, shall be your minister. If you're going to be great in my kingdom, you're going to have to be a minister. And whoever will be the chiefest or a ruler is going to have to be a servant of all. Yeah. Listen, real quick, that word minister is diakonos, is where we get the word deacon. Have you ever been, most of y'all, you know, I know most, I know most of you pretty well. I don't know all of you that well, but I know most of you pretty well. And I venture to say that most of you haven't experienced it. Some of you have, but I'm talking about being in a church like in the old days where the deacons like really thought they were something. See, and they still got churches like that Amen. where deacon, the deacons like, man, I'm a deacon in this church, buddy. <laughs> hey, look, I'm on the board and we're about to tell this pastor how the cow eats the cabbage. Because we pay you, sir. And if you don't line up according to the way we want the word of God preached, you're about to be on the outs. Well, let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. That's a bunch of garbage. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Amen. Deacon, no, you, you know what a deacon is? You know what the literal interpretation of deacon is? It is a table server. Stephen was a table server. But he was so humble and so filled with the Holy Ghost that he preached the message. And you know what his reward was? I'm going to tell you what it looked like in the physical they, they chewed on him. The, the people, the message that he preached cut them to the heart so deep that the way they retaliated wasn't falling on their knees in repentance, but that they rushed him and that they chewed on him with their teeth and that they threw stones at him. But good news, brothers and sisters, because the last thing that he saw when he looked up into the heavens was Jesus standing up. Now listen to me. That's pretty powerful. Because you know what the word of God says? The word of God says that after Jesus completed his work on earth, and he died as the sacrificial lamb that he ascended to the Father, and he sat down. But on that day, when Stephen stood up the table server, filled with the Holy Ghost, and preached the truth, and told those religious people, you sacrificed the King of Glory. You put him on a cross. You've been stubborn and stiff-necked and disobedient to God. You have rebelled against God. And they stoned him, and they bit on him. But what Jesus did was stood up. Hallelujah. Oh, that's my boy. He's down there doing the will that I've asked him to do. Thank you, Jesus. That's a diaconite. See, if you're going to be elevated in the kingdom of God, you're going to be a table server, my man. You're going to be a servant. You know, I read a book one time when I was in Bible college. It's called They Smelled Like Sheep. I didn't really like the book because it was a secret sensitive book, but I love that title. They Smell Like Sheep. I can't stand anything worse than a preacher that thinks he's better than the people around him. And I mean, dude, it just irritates me. Because no, you're not. Yes, you've been called to a higher standard. You've been called to preach the truth. But you're, you're, a, you're a human being just like them. You're a sinner saved by grace just like them. Who do you, who do you think you are? You to, because I've been around them. Haven't you been around them? The people that think that they're, that they're better and they look down upon other people and they ain't got time for you. I've been around it. And, I, and, it's, and it's contrary to the word. You know what the word servant means? It means a slave. One who gives himself up to another's will. That's what Jesus is talking right here. He says this. He says, And whosoever of you will be the chief and shall be servant of all. And in verse 45, Jesus said this, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let me tell you something. This is a mindset, too. When this, when, it, when you die and you're resurrected to newness of life and the Holy Spirit lives in this person right here, this mindset right here will begin to change the way you think. It should change the way you think in every aspect of your life. Mm -hmm. It should change the way you think regarding your spouse. It should change the way you think regarding your children. Yes, it should change the way you think regarding your boss. It should change the way you think regarding your employees. It should begin to pervade every element of your being and every element of the way that you live your life. There's a certain level of servanthood that God expects from us. But many times our mindsets are wrong. And what we want is what we have coming to us. You know, I'm thinking about how stressful y'all believe that Jesus is experience stress? I'm here to tell you he did. 
When he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweats blood. Yeah, yeah. Physiologically, scientists have stated that that is the most, that, that it's possible for that to happen to when the stress levels are so bad that the capillaries and the sweat glands pop. And that literally, but it's a level of, sweat, of, of pressure and stress that you and I have never experienced. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to say you've never experienced stress. Good, hey, news alert, I've experienced stress too. I'm not trying to say you're not busy. News alert, I'm busy too. Uh, I'm not saying you've never experienced pain. Hello, we've all experienced pain. Come on. Amen. But many times we think we're the only ones that are, that are busy. Many times we think we're the only ones that are stressed. Many times we think we're the only ones that have experienced pain. No, man, everybody's in the same boat of humanity. Yes, some have experienced worse things than others. I get all that. But at the same time, we're all in the same boat. We're all experiencing stress. This is pretty stressful right now, what our Lord is going through. He already knows he's about to get hung on the cross. And John and Andrew, uh, John, the, the sons of Zebedee, are like, hey, can I sit at your right and your left hand? <laughs> Peter's, Peter, and there's another spot in one of the Gospels where Jesus said, look, I'm about to go to the cross. And all of y'all like sheep are going to be scattered. Peter said, not me, Lord. They might leave me. But not me. Jesus said, but before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. So Jesus already knows that. Peter's going to deny me. John and Andrew ain't worried about me. I just told them I'm going to the cross and all they care about is being in leadership. Judas is about to betray me with a kiss. Could you imagine being in that room and knowing all that? I mean, just think about the last time you got aggravated with some folks. When you were going through some stuff. Man, I'm going through some stuff and then look what they do. They know I'm going through some stuff and then they just pour more on me. Well, why would they do that? Well, because listen to me, sometimes even good people that love God, the enemy will use them as vessels. That's right, yeah. They don't even know they're being used as vessels. All right. Do you not understand what it means? And I don't say that condescendingly, but then when the apostle Paul says that you do not war after flesh and blood, right. but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness and world rulers, in, in heavenly places? Do you not realize that when you're looking at the physical body in front of you that that is lashing out at you, that is acting almost sometimes like the devil himself and trying to irritate you and press all your buttons, that the reality of it is, is that the, that, the, that the enemy is trying to get at you and that actually, if you stop and think about it for a second, God is allowing it to happen. Yeah. Yes. God's allowing it to happen. Why would God allow it to happen? Because many times there's something in you that needs to be done. Correct. Are you his child this morning? Yeah. Are you saved? Yeah. Have you cried out and said, God, work on me, change yeah. me? Well, hello. Yeah. I prayed that one morning. I prayed, Lord, make me look more like Jesus. He said, did you see what they did to him? Mm -hmm. Like, I think I'm you know, telling you right away that's what the Lord spoke to my heart. Did you see what they did to my son? You over here praying for me to make you look more like him. Okay. I mean, I mean, the Lord, thank God he told me that. Because it prepared me for the things that were happening in the next week. That have happened since then for the last 15 years. Amen. Whenever you feel like, and listen, we all think more highly of ourselves than what we ought to. But you feel like I'm, you're doing everything you're supposed to do. You feel like you lay your life down. You feel like you're serving. You feel like you're doing all that. And, and the next thing you know, you got all kinds of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that. You ain't never doing the right thing. Don't ever do enough. Ba, 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 ba. Look, you think that is, you're the only one that you hear that kind of stuff? No, we all do. Right. We all experience right. it. Yeah. And I just thank God. Hallelujah. Especially like, I'm, like I'm not trying to say about me this morning, but I'm just saying. When I first started teaching the Bible, I used to take it so personal. People would come up to me, dude, that was so good. This message was so good, man. I'm going to keep I'm gonna keep coming back. And then the next thing you know, they're like, I could, man, so-and-so said, you know, da-da-da-da-da about your message. Y'all, you ain't really a preacher. You a teacher, and they don't like the way you teach. And all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, and dude, at first I was like, oh, man, well, am I even called to do this? Or, you know, uh, you know, wait, just all waited down. And finally the Lord was like, Jeremiah, quit looking at their face. I put a word that burn in your belly. Tell them a word. Don't look at their face. Don't be confounded by what they say. You do what I tell you to do. And if they don't like it, they can go find another place to go get what it is that they're looking for. I ain't trying to run nobody out. I'm trying to make a point. The Lord released me. Hallelujah from all that. I don't expect you to think I'm the greatest preacher in the world. Because guess what? Newsflash, I'm not. 
But I will preach the word. And if you like the word, then you're going to like the word. Amen? Praise God. Now, the only reason I brought that up was an illustration to let you know you experience some things like that also. You feel like you're trying hard. And nobody really respects you. Nobody really giving you your, your knuckles on the side. You know, don't expect to get a pat on the back. Yeah. And understand that God allows things to happen in your life and in my life to keep us humble. Yeah. Yeah. Because if, we, if he didn't, we'd be so elevated and lifted up. Man, we think we was the best thing since sliced bread. I know I would. If the Lord didn't allow some people to, to, to not like the way I do things. Or to question the way I do things, dude. If everything was going the way that it was supposed to, I'm telling you right now, dude, y'all would have a problem with me. I'd be like, mm hmm, I told y'all. Right? <laughs> y'all should have listened to me from the get go. But no, you thought you do best. The Lord knows how to keep us humble. Amen? Yes, so the normal human response to stressful situations is to be mean back. Right? To reciprocate selfishness with selfishness, evil with evil, force with force, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. Let's take a look real quick at Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. Matthew 5, verse 38. This is, this is part of that message I was telling you about when he was on, on the mountain and he's preaching to the citizens of his kingdom and he's explaining to them what he expects from them. Now listen, the reason I drew all this was to let you know... Yes, once he gets rid of the plus, once he gets rid of the pornography problem. You know what the problem is with all of those things? Because when you bound up by pornography, when you bound up in an adultery relationship, when you bound up in a fornication relationship, or you bound up with some other substance that's jacking you up, guess what? That's all you're thinking about, my friend. Yeah. You, mind, you might love Jesus, but that's all you're thinking about. When the Lord deal, once the Lord deals with that, you start getting into the Word, and the preacher starts preaching, and the Holy Spirit can deal with your heart. It's like, oh, Lord, I got bigger problems than I realize. Matter of fact, I was just trying to cover up all them problems with all that other stuff. Right, right. And so, so whenever you start to see all of that, this is kind of what he's talking about. And, and let's look what he said. You've heard an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I say to you that you resist you, you resist not the evil, but whosoever shall smite you on the right che cheek, turn to him the other also. How many fighters we got? <laughs> you slap me, buddy, see what happens to you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Go ahead. Feeling, feeling froggy? That's what daddy said. Feeling froggy? Jump. I said, daddy, I'm going to whoop you. He said, you and what army, boy? Bring it on. Bring your lunch. Because we're going to be here for a while. You know? That's what daddy used to say. And if any man will sue you at the law and take away your coat, then guess what? Let him have your cloak also. What I'm trying to make a point here, because there's other scriptures that would, that would balance this out. God's not wanting you to be destitute, but God is wanting the, you to trust that even though they try to take all your stuff, he's going to take care of you. Amen. Is this what you want? Okay, here you go. Because the Lord knows how to take your attitude when you're humble like that and go to war for you. Do you believe that this morning? That's what I'm really trying to get across to you. That's what I'm trying to get across to myself. The Lord can go to battle for you. People might be trying to mess you up and jack you up, but do you believe that God will show up in the battle for you and to take it to them and to make sure that the right thing is done? Because God loves them too. Newsflash. No matter how bad. I've said that way too many times already this morning. But no matter how bad somebody gets on your nerves, i got to give you some important information. God loves them too. That's right. And God wants them saved. Sometimes when our heart's not right, we don't even like that. Oh, shucks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, God's going to bless them too? Yeah. And yeah. guess what? He might just show you that you wasn't all you thought you was cracked up to be when he blessed yeah. them. <laughs> but what you should really want is for them to be blessed. Yeah. Now, only the Holy Spirit can do that. Because right. left to ourselves, dude, we want to be the judge. Yeah. Oh, let me be the judge just for a minute, Lord. I'm going to put it on. I'll teach him something. God can't trust us with judgment. That's why Jesus said, the Father has entrusted judgment unto me, for I judge righteous judgment. I'm going to do what's equitable for everybody. That's how Jesus rolled. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yes. So he goes on to say, and whosoever shall compel you to go one mile, go two. Give to him that asks, and from him that would borrow of you, turn not away. Well, now there's other scriptures that, that say, don't owe any man anything. And, 
and don't expect to get back. And, you know, there's a lot, you know, he who doesn't work is worse than an infidel. There's truth that if you keep bar get letting somebody borrow and you just keep giving and they're not willing to work to take care of their own needs and their own business, that you ain't really helping them. Right? And the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you. But right now what we're talking about is a place of humility and servanthood. He goes on to say, you have heard it been said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you to love your enemy. Boy, I remember Troy preached on that a while back. Dude, that was, how are you going to love, do you not have a hard time sometimes loving your own family members? Yeah. And other people you love. Yeah. Or saying, no, you need to love your enemy. Yeah. Boy, don't make me start breaking that one down. The people that have done you dirty. The people that have taken from you and have slandered you. I'm not telling you you got to go bow down at their feet, but you got to get your heart right with the Lord. And you got to allow the Lord to do a work in your heart. You don't want bitterness to creep up in your heart and to jack you up and to prevent you from walking on. Because the next thing you know, you'll turn around five years later and they over there on the mountaintop serving Jesus. And you over here bound up like the man of gathering uh, in chains of bitterness. You gotta learn, we gotta learn how to recognize whenever the enemy's trying to do that. And God, yes. God will allow those things to happen just for a test in our own life. Mm -hmm. He said, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Because, see, God causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. Mm -hmm. God. All of them are his creation, but they're not all his children. Mm -hmm. But you are the father's children. Yeah. And so therefore, your response must be different than them. Right. Or else you look just like them. Right. All right? And so, in the most stressful of times that he was facing the greatest trials of his life, a time when you would expect that those closest to him would be compassionate regarding his situation, but instead they're selfish. And in that time, his response is one of love and service. I want you to think about that. I said a whole lot in between, but what I wanted to give you a picture of, this is a very stressful time in Jesus' life. And I don't know about you, but if you pour enough stress on that, what's going to come out of by the grace of God, I think that he's helped me to some extent to, to respond differently in situations. But, I mean, think about that. Some of y'all know, right? right? You find yourself in these stressful situations and things going on and the things that come out your mouth. And, and, and the behavior is not the way that it's supposed to look, right? Am I just telling the truth? I am. I'm telling the truth. So when we get in those stressful situations, that's the natural tendency of the flesh. That's him. That old man. That wants to respond that way. But what Jesus does is something completely different. See, he's the leader of our kingdom and he's our master and yeah. he's here to show us. Yeah. And look at this. When Jesus knew that his hour was come, that's John chapter 13, verse 1. When Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world, what does he do? He takes a moment and he stops and he does one last teaching. And his teaching has this illustration of the of washing their feet. But look at this. The first thing that I notice. Clothe yourself in humility. Look at verse 4. Chapter 13. <laughs> verse 4. It says that he rises from supper. He laid aside his garments. And he took a towel. And he girded himself. Look if you study the Bible enough. Then you're going to begin to see the truth. That Jesus. See this is a big concept right here. And if you don't understand it completely. It's okay. Jesus was the word that spoke the worlds into existence. Right, right. So before Jesus, the incarnation, have you ever heard of that word? We're not talking about reincarnation, that's in Buddhist thing. We're talking about the incarnation. When Jesus clothed himself in humanity. See, before that, Jesus was already in existence. He's the eternal son. He's the eternal word. He spoke the world into existence. <clears throat> Proverbs 8, he was wisdom that sat alongside the father that, that, that was part of creation. But then the incarnation came and Jesus clothed himself in humanity. He never stopped being God, but he laid aside, he willingly laid aside his deity so that he could walk as humanity. Amen? So that he could die for us. 
And so he unclothes himself. What a beautiful truth that we find in this story that he unclothes himself as of his outer garment. It's symbolic of him leaving aside his deity. And what he does is he now clothes himself with a servant's towel. And, and this is the heart of Jesus. And if Jesus is living in our heart, then God's desire is that this would be our heart also. Take a look real quick at Philippians chapter 2, verse, uh, starting in verse 5. And we'll just read through. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus. See, though he was in the form of God, another translation says that I think a little more clearly, he did not consider it something to be held on to. Instead, he released it. So, and he made himself of no reputation. So he was in the form of God, but he was willing to release that position and make himself of no reputation and take upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And he was found in fashion as a man and he humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has also has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. Amen. And so he said, let the same mind be in you that was in Jesus. Right. It's a mindset of humility where Jesus said, I am God and I am worthy of worship. The angels know who I knew who I was, but I humbled myself and I became a man. So why? So that I could serve you. Amen. Yes. And now when you get a revelation of that, that same mindset is supposed to be in us. That we would be servants. Amen? Amen. I hope you like that. Yeah. Yes. See, the way it works is this. You get saved. The Holy Spirit lives in you now. Right. Amen? Amen? The Holy Spirit reveals to our heart the heart of Jesus. We die to self. The heart of Jesus is resurrected in our hearts. And this is every day in every situation yeah. that we face. And the longer we start to practice this, the more used to we get to it, and the more we begin to realize. I've told the story before. I was on my way to Florida, and look, they got this little clip system. Green means you ain't been in the, you haven't been in the room. Blue means they need a shot. This, the blue clip was on the, blue clip was on the thing. I was at work. Blue clip was on the thing. That means I've done my thing. Shot, shots need to be done. I'm on my way to Florida, baby, and I'm walking down the hallway, and all of a sudden, they call me up. Matt, you got a patient in room one? I'm like, well, no, I don't. You got the blue clip up. It's time for them to get a shot. Oh, yes, we accidentally didn't put the right clip up. I walk back up in there, throw my keys up on the desk, <laughs> go see this patient, and then I'm walking back down the hallway, and the Lord says, do you like having fellowship with me? <laughs> yes, sir. Then go handle your business, son. Right. Went back up in there and I told that nurse, I'm so sorry the way I threw my keys on the desk. She's like, I mean, I didn't intend to go. Okay, I'm just telling you the Lord told me to go. Right, right. <laughs> the Lord don't want me to walk around with no stinking attitude. Come on, right. I could have ignored that. Yeah. Yep. You know? I could have ignored that, but it was one step in a process that made me realize people were watching you. The Lord wanted me to be aware. People are watching you, boy. Yes, you can sit here, you're doing all your preaching, man. You're living for Jesus. But guess what? Sometimes your attitude mm -hmm. is not reflecting me. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yes, yes. All right, point number two. Are you really serving him every day? I'm asking you that, and I'm asking myself that. Okay. Are we really serving him every day? Verse 8 of John chapter 13 said this. If I wash you not, you have no part with me. Peter didn't want the Lord to wash his feet. But then when Jesus said that if you won't let me wash your feet, then you're really not with me. Then he wants, me, wants him to wash everything. But the main point to this feet thing is this. Is that once you get saved and you're walking the journey of life, your feet are going to get dirty. Amen? Yes, amen. Because this world is wicked. Yes. The world is fallen. You're going to run into somebody that you used to know from your past, and they're yes. going to be like, man, you ain't no different. Yes. You're still the same way you always used to be. You remember what you did? You were so jacked up, or whatever. Or, you know, you're going to, uh, you know, or you're going to, somebody that you work with is going to do something wrong. Or there that girl goes again. She called in again. Really? And they're going to just keep her here? Oh, <laughs> 
Oh, do they not see how hard I have to work when she calls in? Do they not see that I gotta pick up her slack? Ugh! And I'm over here living like a time bomb about to explode. Yeah. They don't even recognize how hard I work for them. Right. Can somebody give them a snooze flash and let them know that I work so hard for them? I'm the best thing they got, man. They're about to let me walk out the door. I know I'm preaching to you, sir. Right. I saw your face over there, figured I'd keep riding. Yeah, Lord help us. But every day, in every situation, when we realize that those things are going on, we're supposed to be like, Lord, let me die right here. Oh, teach me humility. And I'm telling you right now that there's a grace that flows from that. When you just when we start to practice it. Now you got a joint communion. You know, there's I keep telling you about that word koinonia. It means communion, but sometimes it just means joint participation. Right. It means you gotta participate with the Holy Spirit. You can know what's right, but then you gotta humble yourself and do it. Amen. And if you'll take the first step, he'll give you grace to keep going. Yeah. Amen. 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 So wherever the attitude needs to die, don't be going to talk to my wife. <laughs> but wherever the attitude needs to die we need to join participate with the Holy Spirit and allow him to do the work that needs to be done yes. right. every day yes. see you're already clean if you believe the truth but do you, but do you have to, you, we have to stay clean we have to keep living for Jesus we have yeah. to keep growing in him you can't just say a little prayer and think that you're good to go as you walk this dirty world the enemy is going to cause all kinds of frustrations to make you want to quit, to make you feel frustrated, yeah. to make you get back in your flesh, to make you get irritated, to make you retaliate on other people, to make you make decisions that are going to affect your life. Yes. I, I don't, I, look, man, I keep telling this story too, and I'm sorry if I keep you here a little too long, but these are life lessons, and this is important. <laughs> I've known some people that have changed jobs more than they changed their underwear. Yeah. <laughs> And, and listen to you, if that's you, then don't be mad at me. <laughs> just, just take the word and heed it. Because at some point in time, dude, it ain't them. <laughs> I'm not saying it's never them. That's not what I'm saying. Because trust me, we all know that sometimes there's some people that are hard to work for. But what I'm trying to say is, is that if it keeps on happening day after day after day after day, it might not be them, it might be you. Because everywhere you go, people are going to be jacked up. Everywhere you go, nobody's going to, there's going to be people that aren't going to respect you and aren't going to treat you right, right? So you thought that the grass was greener. Wait till you get over there. I heard somebody say, you, you saw the grass was greener, you didn't know there was a septic tank under there. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and I'm just saying, like, you know, things that want to make us quit and we, and we just feel like, you know, what's, what's the answer? And, 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 and the Lord's trying to deal with us. And until we all stop and allow the Lord to deal with us, that situation is going to keep happening. That is true. Amen. I mean, this isn't really on this point right here, but it is part of it, too. Sometimes we're just never satisfied with whatever we have. Right. All I'm trying to, I'm just trying to encourage you. Because if that's what you're dealing with, nothing physical is going to please it. I know you think in your mind the next thing tomorrow when you get it is going to please it, but trust me, just write, start keeping a little journal for yourself. And I don't say that condescendingly. The next time you think in your mind, man, I really want to get this. I don't, I'm not trying to get all psychological on you. I'm just trying to make a point, an object lesson. Write it down. This is what I wanted today. I'm going to bless myself and go get this thing. Now that I have this thing in about two weeks, how do I feel? I'm going to tell you. Can I tell you already? Empty. <laughs> Frustrated because the dog one thing I went and bought ain't even doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Now I might want to get rid of it. I'm just saying. Right. Yeah, I mean, if you can sell it and make it turn a dime on it, okay. <laughs> you might go, into, <laughs> might go into a new business. I don't know, but a lot of times we lose money on the deal, right? Right. I'm just trying to say that there's always going to be something else. I know I talked about this about three weeks ago with my beach house in Destin. I just knew that if I could get me a job working in Florida on the beach, I was going to be happy. And finally, the Lord revealed to me, no, Matt, that ain't going to do it for you either. And, and you know, and the nicer car, the nicer, I, none of that stuff's going to make you happy. Is it, is it okay to have it? If you can afford it, yes. yes. 
But if you think it's going to make you happy and bring fulfillment to your life, you are wrong. Why? Because now my spirit lives in you. Right. If you're saved, my spirit lives in you. And the only thing that is going to work, and we're about to get into it, the only thing that's going to make you happy, the only thing that's going to make you feel blessed, if you're genuinely saved, if you're not saved and you're still a whirlwind, then you can probably try to get some happiness But if from that other stuff. But if you're saved and the Holy Ghost lives in your heart, good luck, brothers Amen. and sisters. That's right. He's just going to keep on being a dead end. Amen. A picture is worth a thousand words. In verse 14 of John 13, he said this. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. The word example there means an exhibit for imitation. What he gave us was an exhibit or an illustration before you went to the cross. And this, what this thing is glaringly saying is you and I are supposed to be serving one another. That means we're supposed to prefer our brother more than ourselves. That means that when we make decisions, we're supposed to think about how it's going to affect other people. Really? Oh, man. <laughs> but I don't want to be held to that standard. Well, then you better, you better go back to reading the word of God. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> I mean, if you're really going to be a Christian... I'm talking about a real Christian. Jesus said, you can't just be thinking about yourself and everything that you do. How is your decision today going to affect your brother and sister right. tomorrow? Right. Well, I'm telling you right now. Amen. But it don't matter because I want to be happy. Listen, you know how many Christians each and every day make decisions based on that? Yeah. I got a right to be happy. And you go ahead and get on your social media. I'm not over here fussing at you for getting on Facebook. That's not what I'm saying. I done got rid of Facebook because I act like a fool on Facebook. <laughs> and y'all be like, man, I ain't going back to that church. That pastor act like a fool on Facebook. He's calling everybody out. <laughs> but you get on Facebook and you look at the wisdom that the Christians on there talking about. I got a right to be happy. I'm about to go get my happiness. Oh, you go, girl. You go, boy. You... Be blessed in your new life. They ain't even talking about the fact that this person just completely broke every commandment in the word of God. <laughs> oh, yeah, you go, brother. You go, sister. Go get your happiness on. Man, what, what have we forgot about the word of God? Amen. But, but everybody's like, oh, man, you know how many Christians are doing that these days? Oh, and that makes it okay? God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Though the flower may fade and the grass may wither, the word of the Lord stands forever. God's word doesn't change. God's heart doesn't change. He gave us his word and his spirit so that we could know his will, surrender to his will, submit to his will, and do his will. And we all need help right. to do that. Right. But we can't just give in just because everybody else is doing it. Because what, what are we going to do? Okay. We all want to believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Lord, come back. Amen? All right. Let's just pretend for a second, though. Let's just, just, just <laughs> amuse me for a moment. And all of a sudden... Some peace treaty is signed and some antichrist rises up, breaks the peace treaty and says, now you got to get a shot and a chip in your hand to prove you got a shot so that the rest of the world will be safe. Well, look, man, pastor, <laughs> pastor, so-and-so, they got 30,000 people in this church, got him a chip. And look, he's still the same. He's still happy and silent and he still preaches his encouraging message. Everything's the same. He did it. That other preacher over there did it. His whole congregation did it. They're all good. So we got to just follow the lead of what the whole supposed church world is going to do, even though we know the word of God. Dude, really? Do they have to put a chip in me? No, they don't have to put a chip in me. I mean, I'm not saying that they're going to do that. I'm just going off on a tangent here. Why would they need to put a chip in me? I am not a dog. I'm an American citizen. I don't want no chip in my hand or my head. I'm just saying, though, you don't think that there's going to be a whole lot of Christians. Look, Christians think homosexuality is okay. Yeah, Christians think that go and find their own love outside of the covenant of God is okay. Yeah. Christians think that doing whatever they want to do is okay and all the other Christians are doing it. And so, therefore, they think that it's okay. No, it's not okay because it's contrary to the world. Amen. We're talking about trying to. I got off on that tangent because people are trying to find happiness. Yes. Yes. And 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 everybody out there is trying to act like it's okay to just go find your own happiness. All right, this is my last thing. I'm about to close. You ready? That's why you're not happy. 
because you're trying to find happiness in everything where it doesn't exist. Amen? And I didn't come up with this. Look at this, verse 17. John chapter 13, verse 17. If you know these things, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. What things? Surrender. Humility. Servanthood. Doing the will of God. Doing it Jesus' way, not your own way. Because listen, one thing that will happen, and sometimes, yes, you have rights. As an American citizen, you have rights. And I'm not saying you should never exercise those rights. But at the same time, you got to make sure that you exercise in your American citizen rights aren't contrary to you exercising your kingdom of God. Amen. And you can start to think in your own mind, I got a right, man. I got a right to do this. You know, you can, look, we got a couple of business owners in here. We got other people that are probably watching on Facebook that own businesses. And you got rights as a business owner. Amen. And I mean, and I think that a lot of times you should exercise those rights. You can't just let your employees do take over. But at the same time, there's always a right way and a wrong way to handle that too. Right? And as an employee, I don't even know why I'm getting off all along all that. I just talked about that Wednesday. But as an employee, there's a right way to handle your business with your employer. That's right. You know, one of the things that I, I'm going to go ahead and take this, because I was thinking about this the other day with my boss. One time, somebody was saying lies about me. And he, and he made a rule. And he knew I was going to call and fuss about the rule. He had already warned the office manager when Matt calls, tell him I'll be there after work. <laughs> I called up, dude. She said, he said he will be there to talk to you after work. <laughs> so it's already fueled. And I sit down, and he tells me the new rule that's been made all because of Matt. <laughs> and when he tells me that rule, I said, well, that might not work for me. And this was his response. <laughs> what? A week and a half ago, you just told me I was the most productive person in this practice. A week and a half ago, you just told me I was making more money for them than they were making for themselves. And he just shrugged his shoulders. And I felt the anger rise up on the inside of me. And I felt my face turn red, and I was this close to saying something that was going to make my flesh feel so good. I was about to just give it to him the way that Matt can really do it if he just lets it loose, boy. I'm telling you, I was about to give it to him good. And all of a sudden, the Lord just whispered in my ear, don't do it. Keep your mouth shut. And you know what? Two days later, that whole thing was flipped around. He called me up and he told me, Matt, I don't expect you to do nothing I ain't going to do. And, you know, all this kind of stuff like that. And I was this close to, to changing my life. Right, right, right. Hang on out. What a, what a test. Right. Lord, help us to be humble because, see, yes. what he's trying to tell us is this. Just trust me. Yes. I got a way of doing things, and sometimes I'm allowing stuff to happen just to see if you're still going to trust me. Yes. And to see if you're really still going to serve me. And whether or not you have faith to know yes. that I am the one that brings promotion. I am the one that brings the raise. I am the one that elevates and exalts. Hallelujah. Resist, I resist the power. That in due time I may exalt you. You think I don't know how to promote you? Yes. You think I don't know how to take care of you? Yes. You think I don't know how to heal you? No, I know how to do all that. You think I don't know whenever they're treating you wrong? You think I don't know when you're treating them wrong? I know it all. I'm equitable. That's why the Father has entrusted judgment to the Son because I judge righteous judgment. And He ain't out just to take care of your partner. He ain't out just to take care of your spouse. He's out there to take care of you too. Yes. Amen. 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 And we get, Lord, help us to see that. Now, I want you to come play us a song. We're going to end in worship. I don't know what you're going through this morning. If the message ministered to you in any way, listen, as you worship the Lord, praise God. As we worship the Lord with this song, just begin to pray to the Lord. If you need prayer, the altars are always open. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, amen, you can come up here and I'll pray with you to receive